Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to welcome you tonight. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for our alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences, regardless of your location. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's featured presenter, Distinguished Professor Emeritus John Bodner from the IU Department of History. Dr. Bodner is a renowned scholar and teacher whose research focuses on the representation of violence in American memory and culture, and he is particularly interested in the political and cultural struggle between heroic and traumatic experiences that follow episodes of state-sponsored violence. He is the author of several books uh, about tonight's featured topic, American Patriotism, all of which are available for purchase online. Following his presentation, Professor Bodner will be joined by IU Department of History Chairperson and the Paul V. McNutt Professor of American History, Michael McGurr for the audience Q&A session. An award-winning scholar and teacher, Professor McGurr's research focuses on issues of power, ideology, culture, and the relationship of public and private life. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion simply click on the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar. Hover your mouse over your screen and your toolbar should appear. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Bodner for his presentation. Thank you. Good evening. I'm about to bring up the slides, but I've been interested in the um, topic of patriotism for a number of years. It strikes me that while people talk about being patriotic all the time, and probably whether you live in a red state or a blue state, they would say that it means I have an affection for my country or love my country. It's clear that when you dig a little deeper, all sorts of meanings are attached to the sort of um, expression uh, of patriotic loyalties in this country and other countries as well. I want to concentrate tonight mostly on the two decades since 9-11, because I think it's been particularly interesting that in that this particular period of time, uh, there's been such a transformation in the sort of meanings that I see articulated uh, throughout the country uh, regarding patriotism. Most of you would, I think, agree that right after 9-11, Americans everywhere were expressing some form of affection, uh, loyalty, allegiance uh, to the United States. There certainly seemed to be a fairly pervasive sense of unity within the country. People were ready to go to war. They were uh, honoring the heroes who uh, were trying to save people when the Twin Towers crashed in New York. But I think it's also pretty clear that as we speak tonight, the, our sense of unity has been essentially shattered and the diverse set of meanings that are now attached to patriots and patriotism uh, has been quite extensive. Those photographs depict um, the, uh, the one of the firemen or the first responders uh, they're standing in the rubble after 9-11 and they're raising an American flag and they along with millions of other Americans were raising the flag uh, in those particular days just after the terrorist assault, the assaults on New York, uh, in Shanksville, Pennsylvania and in uh, Washington, D.C. That particular photograph of the three firemen who were certainly American heroes at that moment in time uh, was often compared to the flag raising, the famous flag raising of the photograph uh, on the American forces at Iwo Jima in World War II, which was a bloody battle in the war, eventually an American victory, although a cost of an enormous amount of American and Japanese lives. Um, and it was sort of a reflection of the a mood, I think, of the times uh, that uh, we had heroes fighting in the Pacific in 1945, and we see in the minds of many the emergence of American heroes again in the af aftermath of the assault uh, conducted by terrorists in 2001. That's a photograph in, of, of the um, field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Some of you may remember that in Shanksville, 
the uh, United Flight 93 crashed. Uh, the uh, passengers that were taken hostage fought back. Uh, they tried to um, take the plane back from the terrorists. Uh, as the terrorists were aiming the plane toward Washington, D.C., many felt that the um, that terrorist uh, plane was headed right to the Capitol building, perhaps the White House. And in the struggle of the passengers to um, take back the plane, the plane crashed in this field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, <coughs> which is in Western Pennsylvania, not too far off the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And so people uh, spontaneously honored the heroic actions of the passengers of Flight 93. Certainly they were seen as uh, patriotic heroes, and someone came up with the idea of turning them into patriotic angels uh, and sort of uh, turning their actions into something, some sacred and patriotic event, which most people, I think it's fair to say, uh, respected uh, substantially. I want to stress tonight that 9-11 and the attacks on 9-11 led not only to a bloody war abroad, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and remnants of that war still are continue in various parts of the world, but it also instigated a cultural war and a war that pitted Americans uh, against each other, I think, over the very meaning of what patriotism meant to them. In fact, that debate over patriotism was really a debate about what sort of country we should be over, over what sort of identity really best characterize Americans. So some questions to consider as I move forward. Uh, and these are taken from uh, many observations of many people, but some scholars would ask, are, is your patriotism hollow? By that, I mean, is you just, you're gonna wave the flag hanging on your porch on the 4th of July. Maybe you sing the national anthem at a baseball game, but what does he really mean by that? Is there any more depth uh, to that particular understanding or exercise of what you feel your allegiance to the United States or to your nation is? And that of course implies that there's a question of whether your patriotism is really more than simply an expression of allegiance but is it really invested in some political dream? And, and the two sort of competing dreams that seem to be uh, characterizing the debate over patriotism since 9-11 and the one that exists in our own times is the one between a dream of America as a functioning democracy and another as a perhaps an emerging state more, interest, more interested in an authoritarian type of regime and political um, uh, structure than in one that's traditionally democratic. And I think the following question at the bottom really gets at the heart of what we'll be speaking tonight. And that is when you express your patriotism and you say you're a patriot and you love your country, to what extent can you love or have some high regard for all the people in that country? Easy to say, and as I think we'll see, and perhaps you already suspect, not so easy to realize. Well, there's two versions of patriotism. You've got marchers in Selma, Alabama, 1965. They're black and they're white and they've got regard for each other because they want fair voting rights for all. That was a big question in 1965. And if you're reading the newspapers and paying attention, uh, you know it's a raging issue today. The other photograph, uh, is a protest conducted by white citizens of Boston protesting busing into the neighborhoods for the purposes of racial integration in 1976. And there the man from South Boston is using the flag to impale an African-American who's, who's of course opposing their particular point of view. We've got a sort of patriotism on the one side that is democratic leaning, people regarding the rights of others, and on the other side, people disagreeing over what those rights may be and not particularly agreeing at all. I think for the purpose of the discussion, I wanna to talk tonight about patriotism in sort of two broad and general ways. On the one hand, I'm gonna suggest that it's empathic, that, and you can read it just as I can see it, and that is that 
it's a it's a sort of version of patriotism which is riveted to some sort of semblance of human rights for all and some ideal of democratic values. You don't have to love everybody in the country. You don't know everybody in the country. Most of us are strangers to each other, but we have some regard for equal rights for all. And I think one of the interesting ways to, to see or look at the sort of contest over the extent to which we can express and articulate a type of patriotic logic that supports a more inclusive democratic vision is to look at the way we respond to the pain and the needs of others. And hopefully that will become clearer as I move forward. And one of the ways we do that or don't do that is our willingness to mourn the dead, the dead in wars, maybe the dead in pandemics. Uh, and as you'll see tonight, that becomes a contentious issue in the decades after 9-11. The graphic there is a silhouette of two American soldiers. One is carrying the other. And I put that up there because it's an image of this, the sense of brotherhood or attachment that exists between soldiers in battle together. They have some sense of uh, selflessness in some sense uh, that they have some responsibility toward the welfare of others. Not everybody can have that intimate sense of brotherhood, perhaps, but it's an example of sort of a selfless version of patriots, in this particular case, exhibit toward each other. If it's not empathic, I think patriotism can be highly belligerent. That particular graphic, uh, which is comic in a sense, as you'll see in a minute, it's not so comic. Uh, that's taken from the front page of the New Yorker a magazine in 2001, right after uh, in November, not long after the 9-11 uh, attacks. And the cab driver is a uh, meant to be a Muslim. He has a turban on his head and he's trying to protect himself from belligerent patriots who, patriots who don't have particular regard for his uh, uh, human rights. Uh, but uh, he feels if he puts a lot of flags up there and puts a sign on this cab saying, God bless America, they're less likely to think that he's somebody that could be attacked or victimized by angry patriots after 9-11. Belligerent patriotism thrives on enmity. It fosters a politics that draws its oxygen from the, the, the extent to which we can demean other people. There's no demeaning, they might not have the oxygen to, to, to move forward with that particular point of view. Belligerent patriotism has a capacity to dehumanize segments of its own population. So the easy way is to say, well, whites and blacks may not particularly uh, always have high regard for each other, but after 9-11, there was also a tremendous sort of animosity brewing toward immigrants and especially people who look like the, the men who flew the planes. And belligerent patriots don't wanna talk about the violence that they may be responsible for. So they're not so interested in mourning their dead unlike the more empathic ones. And these are extremes. I mean, this is a, a spectrum from empathic to belligerent. Many people can exist somewhere in between. And so belligerent patriots are more than willing to initiate violence, but they don't necessarily want to talk about it or they want to conceal the damage. After 9-11, um, there were thousands of attacks on uh, Muslims in the United States. Um, the um, animosity, the, uh, the, the anger, the uncertainty of just what happened on 9-11 drove many people uh, to commit, commit such uh, acts. And we had a few, uh, several Muslims uh, or people who looked like Muslims were, were, uh, were murdered, but beatings uh, were uh, widespread, attacks were widespread. And the government passed the Patriot Act, which uh, basically suspended many of the civil rights and legal rights of individuals and many people who looked like Muslims or had some connection to Muslim organizations were rounded up, jailed, and deported. Many didn't were in jail and their families had no idea where they were. Mark Stroman, I think it's fair to say, was a belligerent patriot. He was a man in Dallas, Texas, uh, enraged by the uh, attacks of 9-11. And uh, he went out and killed uh, two uh, immigrants in the Dallas area in the fall, just not long, a few weeks after 9-11, a few days actually, 
Um, one of the men he caught, uh, killed was a Sikh. Sikhs are not Muslims, but they wear turbans. And that, of course, was a dangerous thing to do in the aftermath of 9-11. Another was a, a Muslim from Bangladesh. And fortunately, he was caught before he planned his second attack or third attack, which would have been to walk into a shopping mall in the Dallas area and start shooting at people that looked to be from the Middle East. When he was arrested, Stroman said, I felt I was doing my patriotic duty. Stroman helped me start thinking about all the ways and all the meanings that people seem to have when they wave the flag. Stroman began to publish and write some letters from jail, an interesting guy in some ways. Um, and you can read it as well as I can, but he felt a sense of rage and hatred and loss, felt degraded by the attacks on 9-11. He wanted the Arabs, as he said it, to feel the same insecurity he did. How dare they come to America, my country? So he certainly is expressing his ardor for the United States and his, his particular sense of patriotism. He was eventually electrocuted, but before he did, he re reiterated his, his sort of patriotic pride. I'm a pride, I'm a proud American, Texas loud, the spirit flows through these Texas veins, red, white, and blue. Sort of a quintessential expression of belligerent patriotism. Frank Roque was a belligerent patriot. He was, he was quite angry over 9-11. He killed Balbar Singh Sodhi near uh, 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 Phoenix in um, September 15th, 01. He was arrested and he, uh, again, exclaimed right away, I'm a patriot, I'm an American. I felt he was again like uh, Stroman doing his patriotic duty. Sodi, interesting, was a Sikh, so therefore he wore a turban, therefore he was vulnerable. He's not a Muslim, but he ran a gas station and he, did, he was out front putting up a whole bunch of flags, just like the, uh, the, the, the sort of cover uh, cartoon, if you will, on the New Yorker, uh, figuring the flags would help him and, and insulate him from the attacks that were occurring against Muslims and Muslim looking people uh, didn't work and he was shot in front of his gas station, killed. That's Sodi, the man that was killed by uh, the uh, angered uh, Arizona resident. And uh, his father had encouraged him and his brothers to come to America for a better life. And they had five or six of them in their family that actually came here and they set up uh, throughout the West, they got jobs and their intent was to save money like many immigrants and bring their families to the United States eventually. But astoundingly, his brother was out driving a cab driver wearing a, a turban in San Francisco, and he was shot and killed driving his cab a few days later. I mean, it's, I think it's just amazing that two men in that same family are, are, are killed. And of course, uh, as a result of the anger and the belligerent patriotism that, that sort of flowed out of the um, uh, days after uh, the terrorist attacks uh, as, as damaging and as horrendous as they were. There was an attempt uh, years later to, they, they did build a, a memorial in Arizona to remember uh, what happened to 9-11. And in the initial version, someone had the inscription on there referring to Sodi's death uh, near Phoenix. And there was a big political battle uh, 10 years later actually that went on because the belligerent patriots, if you will, uh, didn't want that to be remembered. They want to conceal their uh, violence in many ways. They only wanted the memorial to record the deaths of Americans and uh, the more liberal-minded uh, part of the Arizona constituency uh, sort of fought to keep Saudi's name there. If uh, long story short, uh, the name still stays. I want to talk a little bit about the Tea Party because the Tea Party is something of a, a transition zone, transition activity between that sort of belligerency we saw after 9-11 uh, that we just looked at and the uh, evolving sense and power, if you will, of belligerent patriotism in American politics moving forward. On the surface, this Tea Party, and you see some Tea Party protesters there dressed as if they're uh, marching in 1773, or, or when the, the Boston Tea Party took place, or maybe 1776, at the height of the revolution. Uh, but they uh, ostensibly are about tax protest, and, and they don't want any more taxes. The particular taxes they don't want, and really hate it, as you may recall, are is the, the, the cost they foresee 
for instituting Obamacare. It's, it's no minor matter that the Tea Party emerges as a protest at the same time that we have our first black president. And it's not a minor matter that the election of our first black president helps to further fuel the, uh, the rising flame, if you will, of belligerent patriotism that came so strongly out of 9-11. The Tea Party members, and there's been a lot of interviews and studies with them, many members of the Tea Party, were not only really against expensive government, and that's what they saw as a, a liberal uh, overspending with Obamacare, healthcare, but they saw Obama as a symbol of the rising power of minorities. That if Obama is getting in power, minorities will have, racial minorities will have more power. This is coming on the heels of all the, the disdain for immigrants and white Americans like those of the Tea Party will have less. So they are opposing Obamacare and overtaxing. Uh, the the liberal, liberal spending now is referred to as socialism, which we hear a lot now. And there is a real sort of resentment here um, of uh, how these particular patriots feel. Tea Party members thought they were, in their, their words, authentic patriots. They were very intent on looking back to the American Revolution. They thought they saw that as the time when militias could gather and fight against tyranny. And in 1773, the Boston Tea Party fought against the taxes and the tyranny of the King of England. But in, in 2009, in 2010, the tyranny is the liberal Obama administration and the spending and the taxing and what they feel is the growing favoritism for those in need. Our government is now the tyranny. tyranny. And these belligerent patriots are not only have a sort of racist ten tinge to what they're about, they're staunchly anti-government or certainly anti-liberal government. By that, they mean too much spending. They feel they're the real patriots because they're hardworking people who pay their taxes and too much federal money is going to what they would call the wrong people. Remember I said belligerent patriots are capable of demeaning their fellow citizens, creating opposition groups among the population, not loving them, certainly have not having high regard for them all. And so wrong people for them are welfare recipients, which tend to have a racial hue in their minds. There's a lot of conspiracy theories emerging with the belligerent patriotism of the um, Tea Party. They felt Obama care had a, a, a provision that had death panels, you may remember this, and that there were these people would sit long and they would, if grandma or grandpa came and wanted health and it was, they were too old and it, it was costing, um, it would cost too much or they might feel that the, the death panels would deny them the health care they deserve. So in, in this place, they, they want health care, but not if it means killing grandma and grandpa. It's not true. But that was a, it was a fast spreading, fast spreading right wing media uh, argument uh, that was uh, really sort of helped galvanize much Tea Party support. They claimed that Obama will pull the plug on grandma. I don't think he did. Tea Party, I thought that particular sign carried out a Tea Party protest is, is instructive. Obama's plan, Obama's spending, liberal spending is white slavery. Now, now you see the more explicit racial designation that the money is going to non-whites, the money is going to welfare. And it's not just that we don't want more taxes, it's we don't think that the government is putting all its efforts into helping the right kind of people. January 6th uh, is sort of a culmination of this belligerent patriotism. Um, you know, you move from the, the attacks on the Muslims, you, you move to the Tea Party sort of version of what patriotism is. And now you look at January 6th and you see uh, the rioters uh, at the Capitol building uh, trying to uh, break in and enter. All of you know by now they did. Uh, and notice the flag that uh, some of that, some of those protest, protesters are carrying. Again, it's a, a revolutionary era flag. It's the flag of the 13 colonies. It's looking back to that time when armed militias could fight tyranny and they are using and now and insisting that our history be riveted on that particular idea and notion that in fact, 
the revolution and our memory of the American Revolution is now sanctioning a new sense of patriotism and a new attack on tyranny, except that it, now we're looking at homegrown enemies and, home, and a homegrown sense of authority, tyrannical rule on the part of the government itself. Recently, been a study, University of Chicago National Opinion Research Center uh, released a study just in the last few weeks, which I just put here briefly for you. There's a lot more in it. Uh, but it was a study of those that were arrested. There's 700 people that were arrested in the January 6th uh, 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 insurrection or attack or whatever you want to call it. And um, about half of them owned their own uh, jobs. They were, these were not poor, all down and out people. They were tend to be white collar professionals or owned their own business. Uh, a majority were from counties. Uh, they did the demographics here. Uh, where the percentage of the white population in those counties was shrinking, uh, a hint that the, there may have been racial anxieties uh, over some of their uh, sort of belligerency. And uh, while only about, according to the study, 14 or 15 percent of those arrested uh, were members of far-right militia groups um, who were certainly belligerent patriots, uh, the study estimates from whatever uh, calculations they made that there was, there's somewhat maybe 20 million or so supporters of these far right fringe groups now, which of course uh, were certainly prevalent in, in the, uh, the demonstrations and the violence on January the 6th. So the, the Republican National uh, Committee is, says that the January 6th uh, belligerency was legitimate political discourse. Perhaps some of you agree with that. Uh, others would say it was a violent insurrection uh, and I thought in looking at that CBS News poll, it was interesting how uh, here we go again with people uh, arguing about what our patriotism means. They're debating patriotism and in their source, they're debating American history and American memory because, all right, the Democrats think it's an insurrection. The Republicans are, are, are going to be that critical, uh, but the Republicans say they're mostly um, much more likely to say the, act, the belligerents were patriotic. That's what the belligerents themselves would say. That's what Frank Roque would say when he was shot, shot people after 9-11. And the Republicans say they're defending freedom. And that's the sort of casting back to the era of the revolution and the legacy of militias, armed militias fighting tyranny. And here again, as I said, the tyranny at home. So if you... Uh, want to think hard about the sort of uh, spectrum of extremes between belligerent patriotism and a patriotism uh, more sympathetic to uh, our normal traditional government structures. I think that sort of gets some indication of that in that particular poll. The Oath Keepers, uh, I think it's important to note, were uh, organized in the same year as the Tea Party, another fallout from the Obama election. Uh, another uh, advanced advancement in the sort of upward curve of belligerent patriotism. And like the Tea Party, they too go back to this sense of that they're defending America against government power. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, they too have this sort of sense of a revolutionary era militias. Uh, but they're much more explicitly racist here. They're not just, uh, the, the Tea Party might couch the racism a little bit, but here, there's an explicit um, uh, critique, uh, de uh, sort of uh, uh, demeaning uh, of um, certainly immigrants. Uh, they're anti-Semitic. Uh, they're, they're clearly racist. Uh, in one instance, they set their own forces to the southern borders because they feel that as an armed militia, they can take the law into their own hands. Stuart Rose, the founder of the uh, uh, Oath Keepers, uh, was on a far right uh, radio talk show, Alex Jones, 2001. And this is Rhodes speaking. He says, Trump really failed. And now we've got a Chai Com, I guess that's a Chinese communist puppet in the White House. And I think we now need to just declare that to be illegitimate, refuse to comply, anything that comes out of his mouth. So, you know, the, the, the battle's on. The Oath Keepers website, January 4th, two days before the insurrection or the, the attack. It's critical that all patriots, they're calling patriots to gather in DC to get to Washington, to stand tall in support of President Trump and fight for the defeat of the enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, Rose is just 
arrested for sedition uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, we're getting a, a sort of a very aggressive form of patriotism here. And they are not only, they like the constitution and they like the era of the American revolution because of course the constitution protects their second amendment rights. And it's not just simply about guns, it's in their thought process, it's about the right to have those guns so they can use their military power to protect the people. So this is not, um, this is all part of a, a sort of historical perspective that involves uh, the right to fight tyranny, arm yourself, and root that justification in some of what's in the Constitution and some of what they perceive to happen in 1773 and 1776. They see themselves, if you see yourself as a guardian of the Republic, I would have to think you would see yourself as a patriot. So when we look at the Tea Party and we look at these right-wing groups, uh, these um, far-right militias, uh, Proud Boys, uh, they came into being with the election of Trump in 2016, Tea Party, Oath Keepers, they all have this nostalgia for the revolution. Uh, they all feel they're true patriots. Uh, they certainly uh, reserve the right to be as belligerent and violent as they uh, choose to be. Uh, they certainly uh, do not regard, have high regard for people who don't look like them or different races, colors, and backgrounds. And they have this sort of sacred history that they're virtuous defenders in line with those who fought the American Revolution. Uh, and they're ready to fight something again. I think this is really key because I think this version of our history that is so central to far right and belligerent patriotic thinking, is very much tied to the debates we have in schools today, such as those that uh, don't want our children to study slavery or critical race theory. Uh, it's part of this effort to create a history that is not only legitimizes their violence, but it doesn't hold them accountable for any past violence or hatred they have or anything they might perpetrate in the future. Ah, but there were empathic patriots too. And just as the belligerents were moving across the landscape in the last 20 years after 9-11, so are those empathic patriots. They were out there trying to tam down the violent, tap down the violence they were uh, opposing Bush, a fair amount of them, uh, more so after Iraq, in terms of the violence we were ca uh, causing throughout the world uh, with, our, um, with our war on terror. And as you'll see, they're gonna be more interested in a critical history that is willing to explore Americans past warts and all its violent episodes, its sordid uh, misdeeds as well as the good things that we've done. They are going to be more human rights centered and less enemy centered. And nobody's more human rights centered than Marla Ruzica. She's a young girl who lives in the Bay Area of California. We start to bomb Afghanistan and all she can think about is not fighting back and getting even or destroying Al Qaeda when there might be good reasons to do that. But in fact, that we are hurting other people. And she wants to make it clear that we've got to consider the fact that we were jeopardizing the lives and the livelihoods of these people. There's a big Af uh, Afghan uh, immigrant community in Fremont, California, close to where she lives. And she goes there right away and she's, trying, she's telling them she's sorry that their relatives are being killed <coughs> in Afghanistan. She doesn't hate them because they're immigrants. She empathizes with them because they're human beings who are suffering. She goes to Afghanistan, she goes to Iraq. She pleads with the soldiers over there, the generals, to, to get a list of all the people you're killing so we can give some kind of reparations to their families. She lo lobbies the government. I mean, who does this stuff? She lobbies the government to, to, to acknowledge that you're harming innocent, pill innocent people, see if you can stop it. And if you can't, try to identify who they are and give them something uh, in, in return. She, at age of 29, she's killed by a suicide bomber in, in Baghdad. I'm sorry, yeah, in 2005. Families for Peaceful Tomorrows are American. They're patriots too. And they form Peaceful Tomorrows because they are all they all had relatives who died on 9-11. And they didn't want the memory of their relatives' death to be used to start a war. Whether you, whether you supported or didn't support the war on terror or going into Iraq, 
they didn't want any more violence in the name of their, their in the name of the loved ones that they lost. They want no more killings in the name of their dead loved ones. They sent del. They too went. They sent delegations. I when I read used to read this stuff. I said I couldn't believe these people. Just the missiles are starting to fall. And they're running around Afghanistan and Iraq trying to uh, to do good. I mean, uh, it's almost like you never read about this. It's hard, hard to make it up. <clears throat> and they're criticized widely by belligerent patriots uh, for saying that their liberal victim positions are too worried about the violence that we're doing is pathetic. They should just leave America. Why? Because they're not willing to commit to the violent reprisals. But notice where they get their terminology, families for peaceful tomorrows. They take it from the words of Martin Luther King. Wars are poor chisels, chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. They don't go back to the revolution. They don't go back to the constitution. They don't go back to the armed militias. They go back to Martin Luther King, uh, who was certainly would not have been a hero, uh, in the far right version of American history. I think it's astounding, and I'm not sure we've heard enough about it, how much gold star mothers, mothers whose sons were killed and daughters were killed in Afghanistan, Iraq, fighting for America, uh, began to mount protest against the war. Celeste Zapala, uh, on one side, she's uh, uh, carrying a picture of her, her dead son. And of course, Cindy Sheen, who gained a lot of uh, notoriety uh, because her son was killed in Iraq as well. But they're grieving, they're publicly mourning and public mourning has a, conveys or connotes a notion that we have some sort of links to other people, that uh, some sort of a willingness to let their suffering register with us. And suffering and mourning is really bad stuff for belligerent patriots who wanna only see our violence in sort of beneficial in, in, in noble ways. But public mourning becomes a patriotic act. I would say it's an empathetic act. And I would say it was part of the, the battle that we're not, haven't fully come to terms with over what we were supposed to be as a nation and what our patriotism meant. She had set up a camp near Bush's ranch because she was protesting Iraq and the death of her son there in August, 1905. If you remember, it attracted an awful lot of news attention. Um, and they put crosses in the ground representing all the Americans who were killed. They put the names of the American dead on the crosses. And Fox News comes out and calls Cindy Sheehan a crackpot. Bill O'Reilly, who's not on Fox, but was then, says she must have been taken over far, far left elements. Well, absolutely. <laughs> the far left is, is willing to mourn the dead. The far left is willing to worry about human rights. So yeah, she has been taken over, but you know, not a good thing. Uh, I always thought it was really interesting that women who gave their sons lives for the defense of America are called crackpots. I mean, talking about conspiracy theories. Camp Casey was supported by Gold Star Families for Peace. Uh, and I want to I stress that both the son of um, uh, Cindy Sheehan and Celeste Zapala, both of their sons wanted to go to war. These guys were patriots who wanted to fight and believed in the fight. So in no way am I saying that all people share, well, clearly all people didn't share the, 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 uh, the outlooks of these particular women, but their sons wanted to fight. Um, the crosses that, that Cindy Sheehan put in the ground in the camp near Bush's uh, ranch in Texas, so disturbed Larry Northern, a, a citizen who lived in Waco, not far from the Crawford encampment, that one night he came and put a, uh, some bars on the back of his pickup truck and knocked over the crosses bearing the names of US dead soldiers. Why? Because they revealed and they, they emphasized that our war and our patriotism led to pain and suffering. And that was not acceptable. There's the crosses. That's what happened after Larry ran them over and there's a flag run into the ground. I would have to say Larry Northern was a belligerent patriot. Zapala so was, uh, uh, her son that died. He was the first uh, American, I'm sorry, the first National Guardsman in Pennsylvania to die, I think in, in I don't know how many years. Uh, but uh, after she comes from the um, funeral of her son, uh, she, this, this is the, the grieving mother speaking. Uh, he was born, uh, buried near Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania with military honors, waving flags and rifles. And what he wanted, her son wanted that type of, patriotic funeral with all that honor if he was 
killed so his son, his son would remember him as a hero. But the mother simply couldn't take any more of it. When she got home, she said, I could not bear any more patriotic songs or posthumous medals presented to me because she could not accept the fact that you could put a positive twist onto something that for her was so um, uh, uh, destructive uh, and, and sort of uh, debilitating and of course, uh, horrific. The last point I wanna make is that not only did the general public and the, and the uh, angry uh, belligerent patriots and the, and the gold star mothers and the far right protesters at January 6th, not only did they argue over the versions of our patriotic meetings after 9-11, but so did the soldiers. The soldiers that actually fought in the war of terror were in similar disagreement. Don't think for a minute that they were all on the same wavelength in terms of what the war meant and what their patriotism meant. <clears throat> in the photograph of Chris Kyle, Chris Kyle was a Navy SEAL. He's holding his book, American Sniper. Uh, and in the other uh, photo there, the on the other side of the uh, slide, you've got Brett, uh, the, uh, the movie version of, um, of uh, American Sniper. Um, both of the, uh, Brad Cooper playing Chris Kyle, both the book and the movie were hugely popular. I mean, they were really bestsellers. Uh, Clint Eastwood made a ton of movie, made a ton of money on the American Sniper movie because Navy SEALs and patriotic heroes, just like the first responders waving the, erecting the flag in the beginning of the talk tonight, were, were heroes to Americans. And they were heroes and they were selfless and they did things for the benefit of other people. Um, and the Navy SEALs for a time after 9-11 became uh, sort of restored. They were, they were sort of celebrated as new American heroes. I mean, in the aftermath of Vietnam, they sort of uh, helped to restore <coughs> this, this sense of, of, of patriotic heroism. One version of our patriotism to be sure, they were inc incredibly brave, very strong, and of course, incredibly popular. In his uh, memoir, American Sniper, Kyle talks about his, the honor he felt in fighting for his country to being a warrior. And he said he saw the war and the shooting and the killing. And it, was a, it was a thrill, it was a thrill of the fight. It was one of the best times of his life is the way he, did. he does not lament uh, the, the human carnage. He does not lament the violence. He sees that it's totally justified. It's his right to do so. And <clears throat> the book and the film sort of convey that although he does suffer from PTSD and that's later on and the, the movie does a better job of revealing that uh, the book does not. So Kyle and most of the um, Navy SEALs look at America and its violence as virtuous. Uh, their patriotism and their violence are, are congruent in a, in, a, in a way. And as Kyle says in Iraq, even though he, I don't know, there's, there's debate over how many people he has this sharpshooter killed, but he said he had the time of his life, no regrets, and he, he knew that he was in a war against savage, despicable evil. That's what Bush said, we have to go to war against evil. That way you didn't have to worry about whether you were killing uh, particular individuals. But probably the best novel to come out of the soldier experience of the war on terror was Kevin Powers' novel. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it, The Yellow Birds. And it's a completely different take on the patriotic actions of and the patriotism involved by the soldiers in World War II. Instead of having a thrill of his life, Powers, who was there, comes back and writes a story of a guy named Bartles, which is really Powers, talking about how he suffered after the war. How for a year he could just drink beer all day. He, he was depressed. He was suicidal, he had PTSD, as many, many soldiers coming back from, especially from Iraq and Afghanistan have had. He saw no heroism or honor in what they did or in, in his suffering or the death of his comrades, which he lamented uh, tremendously or the killing of other peoples. And he really uh, was especially uh, destroyed by the sense of brotherhood he had with other soldiers. Uh, that's that sort of brotherhood I emphasized in the beginning. He could only relive the pain and only relive the suffering. And his novel is telling you that that's the, what you should remember from 
this particular episode. For him, the war on terror led only to tragedy and dehumanization, which is sort of what the gold star, some of the goals, not all the gold star mothers, some were proud of their son's sacrifice for sure, but the, the protesters were saying, uh, I told you about how he, his main character is suffering in isolation of PSD, uh, but he really grieving over the loss of his best friend. And, and this is, this part of the novel I think is really interesting because it comes from the experience of a soldier who was there and in, in, the, in the story, his friend is so dehumanized and, and, and devastated by all the uh, violence and death that he sees around him that one night he walks into an Iraqi town knowing that he's not gonna come out alive, but it's a suicide walk, if you will. And the next day, uh, Bartle's uh, power stand in and his sergeant, <coughs> excuse me, walk into the town, find the body of his friend and instead of shipping it back to America to receive patriot, patriotic honors, which I'm sure his, the dead soldiers theoretically family would have wanted, they take the body and they throw it into a river in Iraq and let it float away because they didn't wanna let the American public feel and see or mislead them into thinking that there was something honorable in the violent actions in which they were all a part. It's an interesting take, and it's not some. You can maybe he's a far left, uh, far left nut cake as well. But that's what. And if you read enough of the novels and the memoirs from the soldiers that fought in Afghanistan, Iraq, believe me when I tell you, it's a split question. Some are on are talking like Kyle, and just as many are talking as Powers. A lot of those soldiers ended up at Walter Reed Hospital in uh, Washington. Um, and Gary Sinise, who you might have seen in the movie Forrest Gump, or who's been on television many times over the years, used to go there and have the, put on these concerts for the soldiers and thank them for their service. And certainly the sacrifices that many of these people made deserve our gratitude. But anthropologists have gone in and spent time with these soldiers and what is seldom talked about is that large numbers of those soldiers simply didn't want to attend Sinise's concerts, get the free food, listen to the songs, because there was, they could see nothing positive, heroic, or even any sense uh, that their actions warranted some sort of um, or honor or even um, uh, gratitude. They were simply either suffering from PSD, they felt their lives were, had been ruined, and they were carrying huge amounts of guilt and shame over the violence in which they participated in. And there's a number of books that have documented this very much. So we've come to the end. Uh, we've seen that our patriotism has been quite belligerent and, and quite empathic. And we, it, most of you have figured out by now that it sort of mirrors much of the polarization uh, that has uh, uh, characterized the United States uh, in the times in which we live. I'm assuming that uh, Professor McGurr will uh, be, uh, uh, launch a uh, question and answer session. Sure. Thanks very much, John. That, that was a pleasure. Um, I, I should say, uh, John is my senior colleague. You wouldn't think so because my hair is whiter than his. <laughs> but he's been a model for me for a long time of what we're supposed to be in our profession, not just the researcher you've heard, but really also a dedicated teacher and a servant of the university. Very few of us managed to be all three of those things, and he is, uh, and has been, and as I say, I admire him. We have questions here. I have a tough question for John, despite how much I admire him, but let me start with others. Uh, and we've got several questions lined up. So John, I'll read them to you and you can reflect. The first is from our colleague, Owen Johnson. John, you suggest that 9-11 has contributed to the cultural war of this century. But I wonder if at least, if at least important is the feel good nature of the 1990s. Elizabeth Samet has written about this in her book discussing the so-called good war and the greatest generation, 
that somehow we were all united and committed to victory, which wasn't the case. And we swept the trauma of the war under the rug. What do you think? Uh, I just thought, just so I understand it. So uh, I guess uh, Owen is asking to the extent that even before 9-11 in the 1990s, um, that we were not moving toward a cultural war. Is that what he's saying? Uh, and we were Seems quite so. united. You were rather euphoric that we won the Cold War. Is that the gist of it? I think so. Um, yeah, I, I think um, uh, there is this, this sort of take on the 1990s, you know, that um, the, um, the Cold War is over, uh, we won, uh, et cetera. And that's supposed to be a ratification or verification that the American way, liberal democracy, the way we go about our affairs, our military, our, our sense of government, et cetera, <coughs> uh, prevail. And we all felt good about that. I think that's a little bit overstated. Um, first of all, there's no doubt that we have this sort of euphoric stuff going on. The, the, uh, grow, uh, the, the whole celebration of the greatest generation is euphoric. Uh, we're putting the vi even the violence of the World War II behind us now. Uh, Tom Brokaw's book is a bestseller, by the way. Nobody dies in Tom Brokaw, Brokaw's book of World War II. So <laughs> that talking about not talking about the violence. But, but, but we really, here's what we do see in the 1990s in part, and that is we, we're definitely seeing a growing resentment and a growing anti-immigrant sentiment. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, legislation coming up throughout the country. Americans are realizing, just as they're celebrating the Cold War, that the <coughs> 1965 immigration law is hard seller, is changing the racial composition and the nature of our, our society and population because we're getting more and more immigrants from Mexico, from Latin, Central America, and from Asia. And so uh, even before 9-11, I think this growing sort of nativism uh, is, is becoming quite strong. And so I think it's gonna help fuel the reaction to 9-11. So uh, we're, not as, we, we're not as divided in 1990s, but I think the, the, the currents of that division are already brewing. Thanks, John. Uh, Alan Jenkins is next and he asks, how does the average American fit into this discussion? These are the people who want to live their lives, also realizing they have obligations, such as taxes, to support the governments, local, state, and national, but they are not in favor of government overreach, as we have seen recently. So how does the average American fit into this discussion? I don't think I, I, I don't think I can say or anybody can really say how the average American can fit in. I think it's too complicated and, and I'm not sure who the average American is. I, I, I would say this. Of course, there's government overreach. <clears throat> and of course, um, uh, our spending seems to be out of whack. And so if, if, if the average American wants to stand up and try to rein in government spending, I don't see that as a problem. <laughs> my, my take on the Tea Party was that if they want to rein in government spending, go and do so. But it was done with, within a context that was sort of racially loaded, et cetera. And so let's first, if we're average Americans, agree that what we're first about is that we have some respect for all others in our country. And then let's tackle the economic problems, but no, let's not demean on the way to trying to solve our economic problems. Thanks. John, it occurs to me in moving to the next question, that uh, unconstitutional undeclared wars are also a form of governmental overreach. Um, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 of course. Yeah. Um, Chris Burns says, I'm concerned that this labeling of people promotes confrontationalism. Belligerent versus empathetic patriotism, that's not opening doors to a frank discussion about the differences that are dividing our country. We need to listen to each other and to acknowledge different perspectives and points of view. So here's a question concerning the very act of labeling people yeah. and its role in confrontation. Um, first of all, um, yeah, labeling people, uh, stereotyping people really simply gets us away from the fundamentals 
of all men and women are created equal and therefore we have to have some regard for uh, some respect for all others. Um, actually, I'm not labeling people in, as much as I'm trying to sort of set up a scheme by which to explain how patriotism was divided. I mean, we don't hear people going around saying, hey, you're a belligerent, you're an empathic. Um, but we hear people saying uh, other things, et cetera, uh, that you're an insurgent or that you're a socialist or that you're a far right uh, lunatic or whatever. And so uh, my, I would keep my answer short to the point by saying that my version of patriotism that's empathic is invested with an idea that we have some regard for others. And by that, I imply that we don't go around calling them names, but we have some respect for their needs. And that's what I thought, I think I did actually make clear in the presentation tonight. Thanks, John. <coughs> uh, then we have Devin Galloway who says, how do we get through this period in history where fear and anxiety and paranoia serve to divide us? And to what extent is our media complicit in the continuation of this societal polarization? So really a two-part question. Yeah, the, the, they're all great questions. And obviously you're all tuned into the, the most vital questions of our time. And, and I'm not so sure that any one person can answer them. But let me go back to my discussion of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, just a little bit. <clears throat> let me go back to my discussion of how both the left and the right or the belligerents and the empathics for, for and I, I'm using this to characterize, I know I'm, I'm using terms here, uh, how they look at our past. Um, one wants to look at our past in a sort of mythical way uh, without looking at all the realities. And the other wants to sort of look at all, sort of the, all the misdeeds that we've, um, uh, we've uh, sort of been responsible for. I think that gets to, to the, my answer here. And my answer is that we really have to fight to get to the truth. And, and, and I, I don't, I think the, the constant um, cant of, of, of conspiracy theories, of, of extremist language on both sides, um, and, and, and the aversion to getting at the truth, driven certainly by part of the media for sure, and the battles in the media, uh, are, have left people not only angry, but confused. And if they're confused, they're looking for answers. And sometimes those answers are, are they're going to take the easiest answer out there. Thanks, John. I do want to say that we're approaching eight o'clock, um, which is our, our official time of ending. But we're happy to continue to answer questions. But we understand that those some, some of you may need to go at eight o'clock. And that's fine. We're, we're grateful that you joined us tonight in the first place. That's terrific. Um, John, I put in a question here of my own, which is, it, it seems to me that so much of what you're discussing is gendered about, um, with notions of masculinity and femininity. So many of the pictures are of men, especially the iconic pictures, guys with flags, guys with guns. And stereotypically in our culture, uh, aggression is, is masculine and mourning is feminine. Um, you know, you think of a group such as the Daughters of the Confederacy that formed uh, women commemorating a, a particular past. I don't mean this is an argument, but I'm curious about the way in which gender cuts across the, the spread you have from belligerent to empathic uh, patriotism. Is, is one more masculine than the other in a certain sense? Well, I, I think uh, you, you make an excellent point. It's not one that I, I elaborated on for sure, although no. it's, sort of, it's sort of implicit in, in the slides, believe it. I don't want to resort to stereotypes again, but the, the, you know, the, mourner, the people who are mourning in my presentation are women, grieving women over their sons, and the people who are yeah. uh, 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 protesting are often uh, 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 angry men. I think we have enough knowledge to know that there's a tremendous level of male resentment uh, toward uh, not only the uh, toward immigration uh, over the last 20 years, toward this uh, the, the Tea Party uh, uh, argument about helping the wrong people, but also towards the emergence of women. And, and I have no argument there uh, as a scholar and a historian, it would be the subject of another talk 
Sure. But it would be a totally legitimate talk, and thank you for bringing it up. But sure. yes, I mean, but but it's not just the immigrants; it's not just all the other things that have caused resentment. It clearly is the the rising power and influence of women. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. For those of you who aren't academics, that's a typical trick. Someone gives a terrific talk, so you ask about something else entirely, as if it should have been there. Um, Lejean White has an observation and I had a question. Um, this nativism is not unique to America. Can you put your observations of the USA into the current global landscape around patriotism elsewhere? Um, again, in the, in the short version of things, um, some of you may know this, and, um, and perhaps the person who asked this question does because he asked it that he asked it. But yeah, there, there, there does seem to be an emergence of belligerent patriotism, as I use the term. Other people would call it authoritarianism. Other would call it uh, right-wing extremism uh, in a number of countries. I mean, Hungary, for example, Poland, uh, even now, um, uh, are, are good examples. of And, and in those countries where there has been a, a pushback against uh, liberal democracy that sort of started to emerge in those countries after uh, uh, the end of the Cold War, um, a lot of it has been driven by the fear of immigration. And so the anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, the, the threat of Muslims or people from the Middle East coming into those countries has, has, has raised anger and fear, which we've talked about tonight, and has propelled a lot of the anti-liberal governments uh, in um, that, have, that, that we see in other parts of the world, especially in parts of Europe today, even in France, which has had a very strong anti-liberal belligerent uh, patriotism. And by that, I mean a, a patriotism and a sense of government that is disdainful of traditional American liberalism or their or liberalism uh, writ large. Okay, thanks. Mark Hurley writes, could the triumphalism of the 90s be seen as a recurrence of forgetting that allows for unity after periods of national strife? Can we find unity without this kind of forgetting or historical amnesia? That is a good question. That's an yeah. excellent question. Yeah. And that name is familiar to me and I, I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna embarrass him, but I think that person went to school at IU. So uh, that, so that must explain explain the, 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 the brilliance of the question itself. <laughs> I hope I was right. Um, yes. <laughs> and anyhow, um, the, um, it's back to the question. And, and, and as I was putting this talk together, I, I, I was struck so much about the role and the importance of American history in all this. <clears throat> I mean, it's a real battle now. I mean, in our schools, for instance, and, and those of us who are scholars aren't surprised by this because that we spent our whole lives in these types of battles and, and et cetera. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, if we're to get to a point where we can speak the truth, where we can begin to regard each other with some level of respect, we have to know um, where we've been and, and we have to have a basis for making improvements. If we think that our history can never tell us anything that we're wrong, and, and here we go, if we can never feel any shame over our history, we have no basis to fight for justice in the future because we have nothing more to get right. And if we have nothing more to get right, if we're self-satisfied, then the belligerency and the polarization is gonna be continued. Thanks. Um, we have uh, an anonymous question which builds on this. Uh, the war on the importance of understanding our complete history in education is raging. How do we get through to others the importance of understanding and learning from our past? So essentially building on what you've just said. Yeah, um, it's not gonna be easy because the opposition is staunch, uh, et cetera. Um, I don't have a neat answer for that, but I, I, I will say this. I'm encouraged by, and this, this is drawing from what I said tonight. I'm encouraged that for all the sort of belligerency and all the sort of effort to, to get us to flee from our past, we've had so much of a counter thrust from the other side, whatever that you want to call that other side. I mean, of those people who are willing to mourn the dead, of those people who are stand up against uh, the violence, 
of those people who were able to still people to march after George, George Floyd's death in the streets. There still is in this country uh, a very strong um, uh, sense and a very strong current of standing up for a history that is true and for a government or, or, or a patriotism that allows for and insists that there be a sense of mutualism and mutual regard for others. So I, I can't solve the problem, but I, I see the, the means by continuing to support those that oppose uh, fleeing from all that we've been. Okay. Thank you. We, we've got three more questions, John. So pace yourself. Um, one is from Bonnie Williams, who's made several observations and then asked a question, which is where did you get your data that the Tea Party was not bad? Or where do you get- I didn't say the Tea Party. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I said it wasn't bad. I, I said there were several components of the Tea Party. Yes. Uh, well, I think where you get your where, understanding- my data. Um, I, I, if, uh, I, can, I can give you some book titles now and um, I, I think um, bodner at indiana.edu, bodner at indiana.edu, I'll answer any email. I will be happy to send you some in-depth studies where uh, scholars, political scientists, historians went and did countless interviews. There's some very good material on this. So I won't go into the books, happy to, happy to provide that information. Okay, thanks. So bodner at indiana.edu. Absolutely. Jennifer Berger uh, asks, where does a belief in institutionalism, American institutions, fit into this examination? Huh. It's, it's a good question because yeah. part of the politics of our times, the belligerent side of our politics, the belligerent patriotism, the authoritarianism, really is anti-institutional. It, 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 it goes back in part to what the Tea Party said when they felt the government wasn't working for them, it was working for others. And therefore they began to have less faith in, the, in our institutions of government, same with the far right. So uh, the problem is that, that institutions, the government really has to strive and we have to strive for leaders who are willing to bring people together to sort of create if you will, government programs, which are as fair and balanced as possible. If we, if we can, if people get the impression that they're being left out, um, left out of whatever you know infrastructure, for example, then you're going to you're going to continue to breed more of this anti-institutionalism. And the reason, the other thing that anti-institutionalism serves is that it allows an authoritarian government and the authoritarian himself to therefore make all the decisions, which is what some people want because they have no regard for others. So it's easy to spell these issues out. It's not so easy to give. Um, and I think I can, we can give goals of how we have to, to strive for fairness and justice for all. Uh, and that I think is our best bet in pushing back against those who aren't interested in justice at all. John, I have one more question and then two comments that people have made that I do want to be sure to read to you. The first is from our colleague, Pranima Bose. Her question, she says, thank you for such a thoughtful presentation. You analyzed how race informs the two versions of patriotism you identified. I'm wondering if you could say more about how the soldiers' memoirs articulate race and patriotism. Are there differences in the understanding of race and patriotism in memoirs by soldiers of color? And I have two uh, points to make there. First of all, um, the soldiers' memoirs don't have a lot to say about race. They do, those in passing, a lot. But there's a, there's a cluster of commentary, if there's such a, if I can use that phrase, uh, in, the, in the memoirs by Navy SEALs, and those that are sort of honor, feel they're honorable patriots, and I'm not saying they're not, et cetera, there's a lot of undercurrent and negative talk about Barack Obama. Barack Obama is not, was not well liked, and there's a lot of sort of 
a negative references to him. Uh, and if you probe a little bit more on what Navy SEALs had to say, um, you'll see, uh, you'll definitely see a strain that, that looks to me uh, like, uh, looks to me like patriotism. I'm, I'm sorry, it looks to me like racism. Thanks. Um, you've answered plenty of questions, John. So let me just read two uh, comments to you about you. Uh, these are comments that have been endorsed by others. Mark Hurley says, I learned, I learned it all from you, John. This is in part a reference to Michael Kamen's Mystic Chords of Memory. Uh, so there's his observation. Uh, Stephen Sackich says, this is a great lecture. I had both of you at IU in this conversation is a flashback to how great both of your courses were. Well, that's very kind, appreciate that. John did all the heavy lifting here, so. Uh, and finally, Candace Hildebrand has just added, thank you for a great presentation. And really, thank you very much, John. Um, and to this audience, I wanna turn things over uh, to Vanessa to wind things up, if she's there. Great, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream. I would like to express our deep appreciation to Professors Bodner and McGurr for their time uh, tonight. We are grateful to you all. I would also like to thank the IU Alumni Association and its members for assisting with tonight's program. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support the faculty, students, and programs of the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the Arts and Sciences Priority Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. Until next time, please take care and stay safe.